Welcome back everyone to another episode of Space This Week, a series that airs every single Monday in which we recap all things Starship, launches and spaceflight events from the past week. Today we have lots to discuss from Starship news, SLS development, launches and more, so let's waste no time at all in kicking things off. There's a lot of speculation among the Starship community about which rocket will be used to perform the first orbital flight test. We've obviously now had it confirmed that Booster 4 and Ship 20 are being retired, so a lot of people are now expecting the orbital flight test to consist of Booster 7 for the first stage and Ship 24 for the second stage, which does have a nice ring to it. Flight 24-7. Maybe not as epic as Flight 420, but it's still cool nonetheless. However, there's also a very strong chance that it'll be Booster 8 that makes the first flight, rather than Booster 7. The reason for this is that we've actually known about the scrapping of Booster 4 and Ship 20 for several months now, before Elon officially confirmed it on Twitter, thanks to an internal source at SpaceX who so far has leaked fairly reliable information. Now, when they leaked the news that Booster 4 and Ship 20 were only going to be used for ground tests, they also specified that SpaceX were planning to use Booster 8 for the first flight test, not 5, 6 or 7. Now, obviously with the rapid development pace of Starship, it wouldn't be all that surprising for plans to change, but considering that the first half of the leak is true, the scrapping of Flight 420, I wonder if the second half, that Booster 8 will be the booster used for the orbital flight test, will also be the case. Let me know what you think down below. Are you in Team 7 or Team 8? <laughs> Speaking of Booster 8, it's currently growing inside the high bay and we should see it completed in practically no time at all if the rate at which Booster 5 and 7 sprang up is anything to go by. Brendan Lewis once again provides us with an excellent overview graphic of the state of Starship development down at Boca Chica. Anyway, the one thing we know for certain about the orbital flight test, straight from Elon's mouth, or fingers, because it was a tweet, is that it will use Raptor 2. And just last week on Wednesday, Starship Gazer caught this footage of the first ever production Raptor 2s arriving at Starbase inside this stylish black truck. And here's a little sped up shot of the great reveal. Are you ready? Da 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 da! Okay, yeah, we couldn't really see much, but you can clearly see the tops of the Raptor engines there. The engines were promptly taken into tent number one. Again, I have sped this footage up a little bit. They weren't literally wheeled in at this speed. Tent number one, of course, is the tent that we saw in Tim Dodd's interview with Elon Musk as the location of the Starbase Raptor storage. What do you think we'll see first? A Starship with Raptor 2s or a boost with Raptor 2s? Let me know down below. Many thanks, of course, to Starship Gazer for their continued excellent photography and videography of the Starbase site. A couple of weeks ago, we saw Booster 7 tentatively rolled in and out of the high bay a couple of times, but on Thursday last week, we finally saw it rolled all the way out and taken down to the launch site so that we may finally bask in all of its glory. It doesn't look like it's had its grid fins installed yet, so this move could just be for fit tests and possibly a cryo proof with liquid nitrogen, and then the booster will be rolled back to the high bay for crews to install the fins. Or who knows, maybe they'll do it at the launch site. Or, this could tie into my theory earlier, Booster 7 will just be used for ground tests and possibly a test of Raptor 2 with a static fire with a limited number of engines like we saw with Booster 3, in which case it doesn't need grid fins. I must say though that SpaceX have done a great job cleaning up the booster. It certainly looks a lot more sleek and streamlined when compared to Booster 4. Let's take a look at some more differences between Booster 4 and Booster 7. Booster 7's stage separation clamps are either not yet added or have been redesigned from the ones used on Booster 4. We can also see that the autogenous pressurization lines have been moved higher up towards the top of the methane tank instead of stopping short of the stringer like on Booster 4. Booster 7 also now has a camera just above the load points, which are possibly here to allow SpaceX to visually confirm alignment of the load points of the booster with the Mechazilla catch arms prior to any lift operation. The stringers that pass over the common dome weld are slightly longer on Booster 7. You can visualize this from the proximity of the Ullage gas vent to the bottom of the stringers. It's much closer on Booster 7. At the base of the rocket, the stringers have been extended all the way to the bottom of the booster. Many thanks to CSI Starbase for catching a lot of these changes. Follow Zach on Twitter for more great day-to-day -day Starbase and Starship news. Another thing to note about Booster 7 is that it's configured to support 33 Raptor 2 engines, which just so happens to be the configuration that SpaceX's Can Crusher rig has been set to. This device is designed to test the stress that Max-Q would induce on a booster in flight, and it does this by pulling down from the top of the booster using these cables, hence the nickname Can Crusher. 
Whether it'll be Booster 7, or the mysterious Booster 7.1, or perhaps some other prototype entirely that'll be used in this device remains to be seen. One test that Booster 7 has already been subjected to is a fit test on the launch pad. This was conducted with the crane rather than the chopsticks, but we have clear evidence that the booster does have the appropriate lift points for the chopsticks thanks to these great shots from Starship Gazer. So hopefully we should see a lift of Booster 7 using the tower arms very soon. Now, it's been a couple of weeks since NASA rolled out their massive SLS rocket for the Artemis 1 wet dress rehearsal. Artemis 1 will of course be a very exciting mission for a great many reasons. It'll involve the launch of the gigantic rocket, the Orion spacecraft making the trip around the moon, flying further from the Earth than any ship made for humans has ever flown before, and returning to Earth far faster and hotter than any human rated craft ever has as well. But while all eyes have been on Artemis 1, NASA have been diligently working on Artemis 2. NASA has now joined the next SLS rocket's core stage forward assembly with its 40 meter liquid hydrogen tank. This completes the assembly of four of the five structures that the core stage is comprised of. The forward assembly consists of the forward skirt, liquid oxygen tank, and the inter tank, which were mated a little while ago. Now, only the engine section, which includes the main propulsion systems that connect to the four RS-25 engines, remains to be added to form the final core stage. SpaceX started the year off with the bold ambition of aiming for a total of 52 orbital launches, which works out to an average of one launch per week. This is a crazy cadence to aim for, but so far they've been keeping pace fairly well. So well, in fact, that it appears they're raising the stakes. Elon Musk stated on Twitter that the new goal for the company is 60 launches for the year, which is quite a big jump from the initial already impressive 52. I'd hazard a guess that the reason for the number of launches going up is because demand has suddenly increased. With the Russian Soyuz launcher now out of the picture, lots of commercial payloads such as OneWeb are now looking to have a different launch provider. And for many, that new launch provider is SpaceX and their Falcon 9. Let's see if SpaceX can manage it. Last week on the 1st of April, SpaceX launched their Transporter 4 mission. This was SpaceX's fourth dedicated SmallSat rideshare program mission, and inside the fairings for this flight were 40 spacecraft, including CubeSats, MicroSats, PicoSats, non-deploying hosted payloads, and an orbital transfer vehicle, which is carrying spacecraft that are set to be deployed at a later date. This was the seventh launch and landing for this particular Falcon 9 stage booster, and we saw it successfully land on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship shortly after liftoff. Over to China's space station now, the Tianzhou 2 cargo spacecraft undocked from the Tianhe core module on Sunday. The China National Space Administration has stated that the spacecraft is in good condition and is set to re-enter the atmosphere under ground control. The Tianzhou 2, in addition to ferrying crew supplies to the station, also performed China's first fast automatic rendezvous and docking, during a test where it autonomously docked to the Tianhe core module. While still on the subject of the Chinese space program, on Wednesday last week, they launched a Long March 11 rocket carrying the Tianping 2A, Tianping 2B, and Tianping 2C satellites. The launch was reportedly successful, and official sources have stated that all three satellites have entered their planned orbits, and together will provide services such as Atmospheric Space Environment Survey and Orbital Prediction Model Correction. China also debuted the brand new Long March 6A rocket on Tuesday. This is China's first rocket that uses solid rocket boosters, sporting four of them strapped to the first stage. This was also the first ever launch out of the brand new Launch Complex 9A in Taiwan. The payloads for this mission were a technology demonstration satellite and an Earth observation satellite, both on behalf of the China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation Limited. On Wednesday, the International Space Station saw the departure of Soyuz MS-19, carrying Roscosmos cosmonauts Anton Shklaperov and Pyotr Dubrov and NASA astronaut Mark Van Tai. The crew landed in Kazakhstan, and I wonder what it would have been like for them to meet with Russian officials, considering that almost the entire planet is in strong opposition to Russia's actions in Ukraine. This would especially apply for for NASA astronaut Mark Van Tai. This mission has been a big one for him. He has set the US record for a single spaceflight duration, reaching 355 days aboard the station. He may also be the last American to fly aboard a Soyuz spacecraft, if tensions with Russia continue to escalate. We do have this quote from Anton Shklaperov though, which he made as he addressed the crew of the space station as he handed over command to astronaut Thomas Marshburn, saying that the ISS is symbolic of friendship, cooperation, and of future exploration in space. 
According to Mark Van Dye, the crew have been avoiding talking about the Ukraine invasion, but one would hope that the cosmonauts themselves, like many Russian people, stand against Putin's war. Speaking of crewed spaceflight, on the 31st of March, Blue Origin launched their latest crewed New Shepard mission. One of the most notable passengers of the flight was Gary Lai, the chief architect of the New Shepard program, and he's been working at Blue Origin since its inception, beginning there in March 2004. And now, 18 years later, he finally got the chance to fly on board. This is probably a first for spaceflight, actually. For someone to fly to space on both a rocket and a crew capsule that he himself helped design. There is Konstantin Fyokistov, a Soviet engineer who helped design Sputnik and the Vostok and Soyuz capsules under the leadership of Sergei Korolev, though I don't believe that he worked on the R7 booster. Do you know of any other people who have flown to space on a rocket they helped design and build? Let me know in the comments down below. Gary and the other five passengers of the capsule enjoyed a successful flight, and with the touchdown going smoothly, Blue Origin could wrap up their fourth successful crew flight and 20th overall flight to space. The final launch I want to talk about from last week was Rocket Lab's Without Mission a Beat flight, which saw a trusty Electron rocket place Black Sky satellites number 16 and 17 into low Earth orbit, wrapping up the fourth and final of Rocket Lab's dedicated launches for Black Sky. Black Sky is a geospatial intelligence service from American aerospace company Spaceflight Industries Incorporated, and the Black Sky spacecraft are Earth observation satellites. I now want to thank my Patreon supporters and channel members who help make this content possible. These videos do take time and money to produce, a lot of the footage you're watching isn't free, and it's the generosity of the kind names scrolling on the left that allow me to make these Space News videos. If you're interested in signing up, then on Patreon you'll get early access to ad-free and less clickbaity versions of videos, and early access and exclusive emojis if you sign up to the channel membership scheme. 